Good morning, everybody. I'm Samantha Vinograd, and I am joined by Senator Chris Murphy from the great state of Connecticut. He is now serving in his second term and is a ranking member of the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee, where he is the top de Democrat on subcommittee, the subcommittee focusing on the Middle East and counterterrorism. Senator Murphy, you and I have talked about every issue under the sun when it comes to the Middle East, from Yemen to Saudi Arabia and obviously Iran. I always like to lead with intelligence. And I assume that most of the work that you're doing is driven by intelligence that you're receiving from the administration to a large degree. What role is intelligence playing for the Senate right now and for the SFRC in particular? Uh, well, uh, Sam, great to be here with you. Thank you to the Aspen Institute for inviting me. This is my first time uh, here at this incredibly important forum. Uh, thank you to Nick for the invitation, uh, Secretary Albright, and to many others uh, in the audience. It's wonderful to be here uh, with you. Um, I, I think it is important to start a conversation about what's happening today in the Middle East uh, centered around a conversation on intelligence. And I'll maybe make one broad point, Sam, and, and, and then drill down into some of the more uh, event-specific um, details. Um, first, as a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, um, we have limited access to intelligence, and let's just make that clear. Uh, we are the committee that is primarily responsible for setting American foreign policy. We are the committee that would debate any war authorization with Iran or any other country around the world. Uh, and yet, there is more and more military activity happening around the world today that is done in a clandestine manner. The information and the outcome and the analysis is not shared with the Foreign Relations Committee. I remember when we were being asked during the Obama administration to authorize a um, overt Defense Department run training program for Syrian rebels. Um, well, we had been running a clandestine program for a long time. I know that because of open source reporting, but we couldn't get the information on how well or how badly that had gone because it was outside of our purview. And so as you have this massive shift of kinetic activity to uh, the intelligence agencies, um, you hamstring the ability of Congress to weigh in when there actually is a public policy decision that we need to make a decision on. On what's happening today, um, I'm concerned about how the administration has handled intelligence in two ways. One, um, they have um, made the deliberate decision to parcel out intelligence at crisis moments to their friends first. Um, and that has happened in particular with the escalatory cycle on Iran when moments happen. Um, and there is a claim that they have intel they're acting on, they will make calls to Republican friends in the Senate. And often the briefing for the rest of us is delayed by days, if not weeks. Second, um, there have been some moments where the intelligence, I think, has been uh, misconstrued. Um, right now, one of the things I worry greatly about, and maybe we'll talk about it a little bit later, Sam, is um, the withdrawal of our diplomats from Baghdad. Um, I think this is a massive own goal, the fact that we are reportedly down to maybe only 15 staffers in that embassy um, is a gift to ISIS and Iran. And it is because of some claim, which has, I think, some merit to it, has, has real merit to it, that there are uh, threats uh, against U.S. personnel there from Shia Iran-affiliated militias. Um, but I will say to you, I have seen no intelligence to suggest that that threat is any greater than what it was during a period of time during the 2000s when we were able to defend a very large diplomatic presence there. Uh, and so I, I think there is a withholding of intelligence and then at times um, a um, overhyping of intelligence um, that could lead to some very bad decisions being made. Well, we've seen the politicization of intelligence in the past, and I don't know if that's what you're describing, but you mentioned Iran, so let's start there. It's in the headlines today. We have a drone for drone, tanker for tanker, eye for an eye escalatory cycle going on right now. Iran has restarted some of their uh, banned activities. Softball question for you, Senator. What would you do on Iran? <laughs> well, let's Let's fix it right here. I never right. like to give him a hard time. Right, we'll take, it, uh, we'll take care of it. Um, so uh, I, I think Nick put it very well. What, what, is, what is so concerning is that in a two-year period of time, we went from an alignment in which the United States, Europe, Russia, China, and India were on one side of the ledger and Iran was on the other. Today, it is the United States on one side of the ledger and all of those nations on the other side trying to work with the Iranians to hold together 
the remnants of the nuclear agreement. And you see this most recently in the discussion in the last few days about the U.S. request to up activity in and around Iran with respect to protections for oil tankers. The Maritime Security Initiative. Can't get our allies to work with us on it, something that you might think would be a no-brainer given the actual real provocations that the Iranians have engaged in um, with respect to the transit of energy resources. And yet, because we now have this new alignment in which we're on one side and everybody else is on the other, we have a hard time getting to them to the table on it. Um, so listen, that is worrying because that may be a permanent state of affairs that hamstrings not only our ability to do some with Iran on the nuclear program, but on ballistic missiles and support for terrorist organizations. Um, listen, I would love for the administration to get to the table. Um, I, I've, I, I think Zarif is sincere about his interest in doing so. Who knows whether he has the support of the hardliners who have been empowered over the last several years. His substantial offer on simply ratifying the additional protocols is not much of a substantial offer, but it at least shows that they're trying. Um, there are a couple other things, though, we could do right now um, to strengthen our hand with Iran and to limit their influence in the region. I mentioned one, getting our diplomats back into Baghdad. Um, every day that we have no presence in Baghdad is another day that Iran can uh, up the presence uh, and the political impact of the Shia militias, right? We are waiting for the day in which this technocratic government in Baghdad is forced out because of the Shia militias increasing political power. Um, Senator, if I can just jump in, to protect those diplomats and more generally in the region, would you be prepared to see the deployment of more military assets to the region, again, for force protection or diplomatic protection? I, I, I would. I would. And I, listen, I think in Iraq we have to have um, a longer term commitment. Um, right now we're doing appropriations and troop level commitments on a year to year basis. Um, you know, listen, I'm a hardened opponent of the Iraq war, thought it was a mistake, but I think we have a moral commitment to help that country uh, rebuild, especially after what we asked them to do with ISIS. So I would certainly support additional forces there if they are for diplomatic protection. And then let me just say, I mentioned one other thing, getting out of the Yemen war. Um, you know, right now is the moment as the Emiratis are pulling out their forces, the Saudis have no ability to really push forward militarily without the Emiratis there. Um, I, I think the Houthis um, are falling further and further into the Iranian camp every single day that war persists. Um, we can um, cut off an increasing source of Iranian influence if we um, force a negotiation. And right now, I think only the United States can get a negotiation done in Yemen. I, as much as I love our UN envoy there, I think the United States needs to be uh, the interlocutor. Well, when it comes to Iran more generally, uh, Ambassador Burns and you, Senator, have mentioned our allies in the distance. Is there any role for Russia and China to play when it comes to getting Iran to the nego negotiating table on any of these issues? Well, th there is. Uh, and I think this is where I think we generally worry about the administration's diplomatic bandwidth. Um, it, it seems as if we have the ability to litigate one or maybe one and a half issues with China at any one time, um, with, with Russia uh, perhaps the same. And so the Obama administration was you know, able to walk and chew gum at the same time with, with China. You did a, a decent job at working them on climate issues while bringing them into the table on the Iranian nuclear negotiations. I just simply think the administration doesn't have the capacity to do that. Theoretically, of course, they could uh, try to help broker um, a return to the negotiating table, but I, I simply don't think this administration has the, the personnel uh, with which to do all that. You mentioned Yemen, and you've been quite outspoken on human rights abuses in Yemen, quite outspoken on Saudi Arabia's human rights abuses. Is there a way for the United States to look at its alliances in the region with countries there, the UAE, Saudi, Egypt, and to stay allies but to hold them to greater account when it comes to what they're doing domestically and in other countries in the region as well from a human rights perspective? So uh, this has been our historic position in the region. We have always said to our allies that we are willing to be with you when our interests align, um, and sometimes even when they may uh, depart um, partially. But when there is a substantial difference between your interests and ours, um, we can't walk down these roads with you. And the, the um, sort of unconditional commitment that we've made to the Saudis, the idea that because we are allies with the Saudis, 
anything they ask from the United States must be responded with an affirmative answer um, is a betrayal of US national security interests, but I also think a misunderstanding of our historic positioning in the region. And so I understand this, this, this concern, perhaps mythology, that if the United States tells the Saudis we're not going to go down this road in Yemen with you, that the alliance will fall apart. Um, but I think it is that, a mythology. I, I think the, the Saudis are certainly making overtures to uh, the Russians, as they always have, now to the Chinese on different weapons systems. Um, but the United States as an ally is irreplaceable. They are never going to turn their backs on us. But right now, they are abusing us. They are taking us for granted. They have become the dominant partner in this relationship. And this war in Yemen is a national security nightmare for the United States. AQAP, ISIS getting stronger, a famine, uh, a cholera epidemic all blamed on the United States. This is the moment for the United States to step in. And I actually think this is the moment for the United States to say to the Saudis and the Emiratis, we want to be partners with you in peace. We want to help get you to the negotiating table, something that this administration has been um, unwilling to do. And I don't understand that. I don't understand why this administration refuses to play a mediating role in the Yemen conflict, why they have outsourced this to a UN, which thus far has proved largely incapable of landing this plane. What leverage do we have? Our foreign assistance posture has changed dramatically, whether it comes to Syria negotiating some kind of solution there. Yemen, similar story. What leverage do we have over the Saudis, over the Emiratis, over the Houthis, or any of the parties in Yemen at this, at this point? Well, I mean, some of this is natural leverage. I mean, this, there, there, there is a, a tiring of this conflict. Um, I, I spend a lot of time talking to all sides of th this uh, war, and this is a moment where I think people want to get in agreement. The battle lines are largely stagnant. The Emiratis, as I mentioned, have essentially pulled out, leaving the Saudis friendless. Um, so there just is a, a moment in time um, that would allow for the United States to come in. But the, we've given away our leverage with the Saudis. I mean, by telegraphing to them that you know, after the perpetuation of possible war crimes in Yemen with US assistance, the kidnapping and dismemberment of a US resident, um, you get rewarded for that. You get a deeper defense partnership. You get a deeper nuclear, um, uh, civil nuclear partnership. You get a visit from the Secretary of State. Um, the Saudis don't feel like they have much to fear from us. Um, if they really thought that we were willing to change the nature of our security relationship, if they didn't come to the negotiating table on Yemen, um, they would. Uh, right now, they think that they have this administration um, in a stranglehold. Would you cut out Mohammed bin Salman from negotiations? Would you advise the president not to meet with him? Would that be your approach? No, I don't think you can cut him out of negotiations. Uh, you know, I, I might recommend to, um, to work around the current Yemeni government. I think there is a, a tiring of the Hadi administration that is, um, that is a, a roadblock. But I think you ultimately have to deal with the principal players in all of those countries and, with, and within the Houthi coalition. Final question for you before we open up it up to the audience. Syria is another topic that Ambassador Burns mentioned. Proxy war was going on there. We withdrew. The Syrian people are still being terrorized by Assad. Is there anything that else that we should be doing right now in light of the withdrawal of US troops? Well, you know, again, I, I'm in the position of having opposed the uh, imported US troops into the region. I just thought it was a, a, a size deployment that ultimately was not going to be dispositive. But once you've made that commitment, you need to follow through on it. And the, the, the literal weekly prevarication uh, on the disposition of US forces in the region has you know, weakened a diplomatic uh, hand that was already as weak as it could be. So you know, I think we should provide some certainty as to our military commitment there. Uh, I think we should be back at the negotiating table, having largely under this administration outsourced those talks to the Turks, the Iranians, and the Russians. Um, and then I think we should start to unlock our humanitarian dollars. Remember, this administration has um, essentially frozen those dollars, has refused to participate in the refugee crisis in the region. Um, we have taken a number of steps to essentially telegraph that we have no interest in being a partner. We're not going to give you certainty on military numbers. We are not going to send diplomats to be part of negotiations. We are not going to help you with your refugee program. We are not going to put humanitarian dollars on the ground. Um, I, I, we wonder why we have no leverage in Syria. It's because we've taken a series of steps to communicate that we are uninterested. And if we were to reverse 
course on at least those four grounds. Um, I'm not saying that we would win out on all of uh, our requests, but we would at least get ourselves uh, back into the conversation. I'm going to ask you one more, just so that we end on a high note before opening it up. <laughs> How are we going to end on a high note? Well, I'm going to put that oh, back one to wait. you. I'm just asking the questions. <laughs> What's a bright spot for Middle East policy right now? <laughs> Um, well, I mean, listen. There are, you know, there are there are still um, relative success stories in that region. Um, you know, Senator Romney and I were there uh, a month ago, and as worrying as Iraq is, um, you know, Iraq is is still in many ways a success story. Not only that we beat ISIS in the sense that we took away its um, uh, its territory, that we still have them on the run. Um, but we have a um, multi-ethnic, multi-sectarian government um, that still enjoys legitimacy. Uh, Jordan, Lebanon continue to be um, oases of stability uh, in the region. Um, I, so I, I think that there are still um, places that you can point to as you try to uh, build stability in other places as to models that work. Uh, it's, it's hard to find um, good news there, but it, it absolutely exists in the defeat of ISIS. Um, at least when it comes to a territory, their territorial claim, um, is really no small feat. The fact that we were able to turn around their advance, um, to delegitimize them uh, in, in the public opinion inside Iraq is um, you know, something that we, you know, sh shouldn't, um, uh, we shouldn't shirk from. Thank you, Senator. And now uh, we'll take maybe two, two or three questions all at once and then let the Senator answer. In the back, yes. Senator, thank you very much. Do you think we need a, U, a new AMF? And if so, what would you like to see in it? Anybody else? Senator, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, yeah, listen, absolutely. Um, and, and Sam, we didn't get to talk about this question of authorization, but let me take a moment to um, express my disgust uh, at how Congress has abdicated its responsibility to be a co-equal branch on the setting of foreign policy with this, uh, with the Article II branch. Um, we um, have given up on authorizing military force, uh, largely because it's a lot harder than it used to be, right? We don't have armies marching against each other. We don't have neat peace treaties that wrap up hostilities. It's harder to define your enemies. It's much harder to define what victory looks like. Uh, and we just stopped doing it. Uh, we didn't do it on Libya, and we should have. Uh, we didn't do it uh, when we went to war with ISIS, and we should have. Um, and now we have an administration that is looking to pervert the 2001 AUMF, which was an authorization to go to war essentially against al-Qaeda as a means to start war in Iran against a Shiite government that has very little, if anything, to do with, uh, with al-Qaeda. Uh, and so I, I just think we have to get back into this business and um, put a authorization of military force um, on the floor of the United States Senate and debate it, see if we can come to an, a conclusion. Uh, we tried that um, back at the very end of Democratic control of the Senate. We actually got an ISIS authorization passed through the Foreign Relations Committee. So it's a, a, a way to show that it isn't impossible. But it is also incumbent upon the administration to show restraint uh, as well. Um, the Obama administration rightly showed restraint in deciding not to bomb Syria without coming to Congress. And there was all sorts of smart people in Washington who said that was such a political and national security mistake that the president showed weakness in waiting to come to Congress. He should have known that he couldn't get authorization. And he should have just gone and done it himself. Well, because you can't get authorization, is not an excuse to violate the Constitution. The American people are smarter than you think they are. They are very wary of committing US military resources in the Middle East. And so they deliberately make it really hard on Congress to authorize war, especially in that part of the world. Congress was not going to authorize a military strike against Syria. That's because the American people didn't support it. And that in and of itself is a reason not to do it. That's what the Founding Fathers said. And so it is incumbent on Congress to get back in this game, but it is also incumbent upon the executive, and I would argue the next Democratic president, to make a commitment that they are not going to engage in any unauthorized military activity without coming to Congress first, um, even if it looks like an emergency, even if it looks like Congress is not going to give you that authority. Let's do over there and then over there. Or we can, you're near the mic, so we'll start there. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator, for talking to us. 
Uh, the one thing very interesting to uh, myself and I'm sure other people here, here we have uh, the first uh, conversation about the Middle East, and it's the first time we've had a conversation the word Israel never came up once. Uh, is this part of a strategy? Is, uh, <laughs> is this a democratic thing with um, you know, working for Benjamins or something? I, what, why is this not an important thing in your discussion? Yeah, well, I don't necessarily know what you, what you mean with that question, um, so I, I, I won't uh, address some of the words you use. But I think um, uh, I think that as we list the success stories of the region, of course, the United States partnership with Israel uh, and our ability to protect their security against countries uh, in their periphery who want them wiped off the face of the earth is uh, ultimately uh, a story of uh, success in U.S. foreign policy and success in the partnership. Um, when Senator Romney and I were there uh, a few months ago, um, there was, I think, very low expectations for the administration's supposed peace plan. Um, I think it is you know, likely going to rely completely on uh, economic support for the Palestinian state and not offer any uh, real political um, offers uh, to the Palestinians. I think it will be um, greeted with immediate opposition um, from the Palestinian Authority. Uh, and you know, ultimately, I think the United States is much better off when we position ourselves as an honest broker between uh, the Israelis and the Palestinian Authority, uh, something that this administration is unwilling to do. Uh, and so, um, you know, obviously, this is a very, very important central aspect of American foreign policy in the region. There are very low expectations for the peace plan. Um, but uh, I think there are still lots of people on the ground here who hope that in the next administration they will give it another go. And Senator, you visited Israel recently with Senator Romney, is that right? I did. Um, and again, we were there you know, just as there was uh, expectation of this plan uh, emerging. Um, and uh, we, uh, we talked with uh, the prime minister. Uh, we met with the uh, new prime minister in uh, the Palestinian Authority. Uh, again, uh, you know, I just uh, ultimately think that um, this, uh, uh, this plan that's emerging uh, has very, very little chance of success. And, and listen, I, I have expressed to you know, both Prime Minister Netanyahu um, and to my Republican friends in Congress about my um, dire worry about the politicization of support for Israel in uh, the American uh, political uh, debate. Um, the latest series of tweets from the president uh, in which um, he is you know, more overtly than ever before seeking to use irresponsibly Israel as a wedge issue between Republicans and Democrats. Um, the way in which Republicans have intentionally put legislation on the floor of the Senate and before the Foreign Relations Committee um, that divides Republicans and Democrats on the issue of Israel, when with a few tweaks to that legislation, you could have gotten 80 to 90 members of the Senate supporting it, um, I think is a, um, is a really dangerous prescription for uh, this debate and dialogue going forward. Israel, when I got to the Congress in 2000. And seven was one of the few issues where you went out of your way to try to build consensus. Um, and that has fundamentally changed in the 10 years that I've been in Congress. Now Republicans look at Israel as a um, gold mine of opportunity to try to divide Republicans from Democrats. And I think that's a really horrible national security and political mistake. We have one more in the back. Thank you very much. Hey, Chris. Um, can you comment on the uh, Turkish conundrum, both uh, tactically in the short run and strategically in the longer? I, I mean, listen, I think the, the issue is simple here. There has to be a consequence for a NATO ally running to Russia for a defense system that could ultimately compromise uh, United States national security, um, period, stop. Uh, I understand the risk of splitting uh, a important NATO ally from the coalition. Um, but if you don't make clear that part of being inside this coalition is not arranging your defense assets in a way that could ultimately compromise some of our most sensitive systems, then I'm not sure what the point of the alliance is. 
Uh, and so I, I think this is ultimately a failure of the Trump administration to not be able to ultimately uh, split the baby with the Turks and find a way for them to get a win out of this uh, without importing the entirety of the Russian missile system. Um, but I also believe that we have to send a strong message here and tell them that you can't get American planes if you are going to be partnering with the Russians uh, on their system that ultimately might be pointing uh, at, uh, at those planes. And of course, from the very beginning, the way in which this administration has approached the Turks has been as bizarre as the way in which they have approached so many other allies. Um, uh, the, the, the hot and cold nature of the president's public statements um, has just been an invitation for this crisis, uh, ultimately. And, um, you know, we, we sometimes think that the president's Twitter feed and his public statements are divorced from reality. How many times has Mike Pompeo come before our committee in the Foreign Relations uh, Committee and told us not to pay attention to what the president says, just pay attention to what the State Department does? Um, that's a really convenient way to try to excuse the president's uh, um, recklessness. But this is an example where the Turks paid attention to the scorn that the president heaped on Erdogan um, and his lieutenants early in his administration. And that mistake, that, that, that social media mistake um, that we all like to write off as just bluster, um, it is coming home to roost for this administration right now. Um, and, and so uh, just yet another example um, uh, of um, you know, how the, the recklessness of the way that the president talks has real ramifications for US national security around the world. Well, listen, I, I think, you know, what's happening inside Turkey today is fascinating. We're going to have to watch the, um, the, the, the politics of the developing opposition to, uh, to Erdogan and his party. There has been no viable opposition there for almost a decade. And, of course, he has done a wonderful job of controlling the media and locking up political opponents as a means to consolidate his power. But you have seen um, these early grass shoots in the mayoral election and in other uh, regional political battles of a, of, a, of a potential popular resistance mounting. And, 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 and I think it's hard to answer which way Turkey goes uh, without understanding um, what his political opposition looks like, whether it can achieve maturation. What we do know is that their economy is, is, is hemorrhaging, is, is hurting, and that um, for a long time they had received, rightfully so, the bounty of this perception globally that Turkey was aligning itself with the West and aligning itself with the European Union. Um, they, they stood in this nether world for about a decade in which they had stopped moving closer to the European Union. It was pretty clear they weren't going to come in, but people still thought of them as a country that you could really do business with. Um, and so they are seeing the consequences of this turn away from the EU and Europe, this turn away from NATO. Uh, and perhaps as they understand that the only way to build a growing economy for their people is to f turn back, uh, we may you know, see a future, um, a, a future for Turkey that is Western oriented in the way that I think we maybe took for granted its future was going to be um, 15 to 20 years ago. So watch the political debate play out, watch the continued atrophy of their economy. I think those are the signals that you can look to as we try to hope. Um, listen, I think they're an incredibly important ally. I desperately want them to be a full, complete partner in, in NATO. I, I root for them to make a decision to re-engage with the European Union. Um, and I think uh, their domestic uh, profile um, over the next few years will tell us a lot about whether that's going to come to fruition. Senator, thank you. We're thank out of you, time. Thank Thanks you. for being here.